you can't learn about the history of Africa and not be activist. I was reading something, your parents were actually part of the Holocaust. Yeah. Your grandparents or your parents? My parents. Oh, wow, okay. My parents were children during the Holocaust. And one of the things that I feel most of my life is hate. Unrational hate. Welcome to Yoel's Hangouts podcast. Welcome to a new season. I know it's been a while. We're going to start cranking these out. But for the season premiere, we have a very special guest. It's Dr. Irit, Irit Bach. Yeah. A, did I say it correctly? I'm still working on my Hebrew, guys. Please forgive me. Uh, she's the head of African Studies here at Tel Aviv University. Um, so she's very knowledgeable about, you know, a whole assortment of things, but primarily um, things involving Africa. We're going to talk about Africa. We're going to talk about the Wagner Group. We're going to talk about... Um, a ton of different things. I'm Ethiopian. Um, some of you guys may know that. So we're going to discuss a lot of the the Jewish-Israeli dynamics with, you know, Ethiopia and, and all of Africa. A lot of things on the horizon with Africa. So, you know, thank, thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so first and foremost, you know, for the audience, they're not, they're, I, I would say primarily most of them are in America. Uh, what would you say is kind of like... Um, what what should they kind of look for in, in 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 Africa? Like, what are some things going on generally? We'll we'll dive in deep later, and then also, what kind of got you into learning about Africa and specifically even Ethiopia? Um, I think one of the things that we people that involved in in African studies say that Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent. It's a forty a fifty four states, and. Uh, Many things are going there, you know, because it's a huge continent and we have to look about different things. But I think that one of the problems is we mostly hear about uh, negative things about the continent, about wars and uh, uh, famine and... Uh, Just dirt and sticks. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, we think that we shouldn't make like ideal picture that everything is good over there, but we should... Uh, Start, but we should look for more diverse outlook uh, on the continent. For example, uh, we see we hear recently a lot about um, a coup d'état uh, in African states, and uh, we we should also look about countries that are experienced democracy and the way the democracy is established there in many African states. So um, my idea is not to look just on the bad thing, but uh, but uh, look. Also, also uh, the positive uh, thing that happened there. Awesome. And uh, how did you get involved in, in, in Africa and Ethiopia specifically? Since I was a little child, I, I like to read the adventure book about Africa. <laughs> it was like a genre. I, like, uh, so for, for, for children. Yeah, for children, uh, literature. And uh, I was also fascinated but, uh, about it. But... Uh, but uh, when I was a soldier uh, during my army service, I encountered first time the uh, the Aliyah from uh, Ethiopia, the people, the newcomers from Ethiopia. It was the beginning of the 80s, and uh, they came to my hometown, Afula, and uh, it was a gr great surprise because nobody knew that there are Jewish people in Ethiopia. And for me, it was amazing because uh, I, I, I taught the, the children they're Hebrew, and and I understand that there is a, like kind of a deep culture, a deep cultural heritage there, but I know nothing about it. So uh, the year after I, I went here to Tel Aviv University, I came here to Tel Aviv University and uh, started to, to learn African studies and also Middle Eastern study because I live in the Middle East. So uh, and uh, and this is uh, since then. Um, uh, I, I have an interest in many things in Africa. I'm not a researcher on African Jews because uh, other people doing it, but I uh, study, uh, most of my research is about um, Islam in Africa and conflict resolution and all other stuff. <laughs> okay. And uh, you mentioned earlier about democracy in, uh, in Africa. I think a lot of people may not even know that that's a thing in Africa. I mean, for me, it, it's a little bit of a, of a shock, I guess, maybe whether it's like deliberate, you know, you know, the media in America de depicts Africa in a particular way, but also there's not a lot of general information about it unless something bad happens. It's never like, look at this country doing so well in Africa on the news. It's like, hear about this coup, hear about this war, you know, this genocide, you know, so 
what are some, you know, uh, you know, how democracies created in, in Africa and also what are some countries that have a democracy? Yeah, uh, fun fact, <laughs> when uh, most of African states became independent during the 60s, all of them uh, came out to independence as a dem democratic state. All of them. Okay. But in a period of like 10 years, everybody become autocratic state, mm -hmm. not undemocratic states. And we are about a lot of the, the coup d'etat and the, uh, all the wars, uh, civil wars. But uh, since the 1990s, there is uh, uh, some continued in the process of uh, democracy in many African states, uh, for example, we can take uh, states like Senegal and uh, Ghana and Nigeria and also South Africa uh, since the transition uh, in 1994. And uh, this uh, kind of process, uh, uh, processes are still continuing in spite of many difficulties and obstacles uh, like Nigeria, which is the, the most populous uh, state in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the continent. It's huge. And uh, the, it's very complex. Uh, it has many uh, difficulties, but still there is uh, every four years the election, and it's free election, and there is open um, uh, communication, and uh, so uh, uh, so. The, Do you need an ID to vote there? Do you need an ID to vote there in America? This uh, is a big contentious. Issue. Uh, yeah, I think it's also okay. there because uh, people are especially young people, have difficulties to get their IDs. So uh, many of them uh, just... Uh, but I think uh, if you... Because uh, Africa is the youngest uh, Country. Uh, continent yeah. in the world. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's very interesting the, the role of young people in democratization processes. For example, because um, now it's very familiar, uh, it's very common that uh, young uh, African uh, from all over the co the continent will have cell phone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you have cell phone, you can, you know, you can go to... Start a business. You can start a business, but also you can watch in the li uh, on the line in the elections. Mm -hmm. And you can see if mm -hmm. there is fraud there and you can, you know, put it in your social media and everybody can see it. So uh, it's very important, the role of young people and also uh, social media a cell phone a, in the youngest continent in the world. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, like, the the interesting, you say it's the youngest, because the birth rate there, I think, like, Nigeria, I mean, all of Africa, and then even Pakistan, like, their birth rates and their, their population is going to skyrocket because, you know, they, 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 they have a lot of children. They have children, I think, on pace of where we were at in America. And, you know, in Israel... You guys are doing pretty good from my 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 uh, qualitative data of observing. Uh, people are having children here in America. It's like one, zero, maybe one kid in you know Africa. And my grandparents, my I mean, my dad had nine brothers and sisters. My mom had nine brothers and sisters. So uh, speak about that. Like, what's the future going to look like? Where you know Africa is like this dense you know populated area that's booming, and then. The rest of the world kind of has to figure out, you know, what's going on. Not that it's a competition, but just what's the dynamic going to be? It's kind of difficult to predict, but I can say that talking about demogra demog demography, it's kind of uh, complicated, you know, because it's uh, some people would say that it's not PC uh, because, uh, you know, it's it's our cultural heritage to have many children, you yeah. know, and uh, but I see here in Israel, it can be a lot. Uh, it can be very problematic. Yeah. To have many children for uh, so uh, it's complicated to, to speak about it in Africa. We can say for sure that Sub-Saharan Africa it's the place where the higher rates of uh, fertility yeah. for women uh, exist in the world now. Mm. Uh, for sure, compared to the West, for example. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's it's. Uh, you can look at it in different way. You can say that it's a problem because if you have so many young people, I will provide them education and job opportunities and any kind of future. But on the other end, you know, uh, young people are power and uh, you can uh, uh, they can be productive power. So it's uh, you Stop. can you this this is either a problem or a good thing that should continue dependent on the future, which no one can predict, okay. right? It's very difficult. Yeah, no, I, I think it's uh, it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting subject. 
uh, where, as far as uh, you were t- talking about the uh, the cell phone, you know, people have cell phone usage. For me, even with uh, my videography business, with my editing business, you know, sometimes I'll I'll uh, subcontract. Like I have an editor right now. He's in South Africa. You know, South Africa. I, I realize like if you have internet access, if you have a cell phone, like some of the edits that he does for me, he only has a cell phone. So he's editing, you know, making money from his phone, you know, just editing, you know, using his creativity. I was like, dang, like he, for me, I've edited a while. I know when something is good, you know, I know what to look for. And I'm like, this guy's good, you know? So I think that there's a lot of potential, you know, with Africa, but a lot of the times you run into issues with just one electricity and then two uh internet access Mm -hmm. you know south africa is you know quote unquote you know kind of more i guess developed than relative to the other Mm -hmm. countries but they're still experiencing this is just from my personal experience talking to that guy i've have i've hired another person they're still having you know internet blackouts you know power outages like regular scheduled daily power outages so you know for me that was a very that was a shock to me i'm like at least you know i okay in my brain South Africa, okay, cool. You know, they kind of are starting to figure it out. You know, the West Africa, they 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 kind of came together, built something. You know, they have the basic needs figured out. Okay, cool. But to hear that, I was like, this is very discouraging because one, I I know that they have the technology there, but maybe it's corruption. I don't know. You know what 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 do you know about South Africa and what what is the situation with that or do you, do you have any insight on that? I know that there is uh, there are many um, uh, electricity shortages all over the continent and also in uh, South Africa recently. It's uh, it's uh, I think it's an issue of managing and uh, as you say corruption. The ANC is still uh, in power after so many years, and uh, you know there are many accusation of uh, power use and everything and. Uh, this is the result because it should be not like uh, in another place now, South Africa, uh, because all of its advantage, you know. And uh, but but I would like to take this uh, discussion to Ethiopia, if please. you don't mind. Oh, please, uh, we're in your house. <laughs> take take it wherever you want. Because um, you, you talk about uh, uh, internet uh, shutdown. Uh, and uh, one of the problems that we have in Ethiopia many times is inter- the, the, the ownership of the internet by the government and the, um, the, the block out of the, the internet in, at many times. When you are there, you are feeling it like that. And, and Ethiopia should be also an example for a developing country because, you know, uh, we think about the, the Renaissance Dam, for example. Yeah. which would the provide um, uh, electricity not for Ethiopia but for regionally and uh, it was a great hope and uh, also the new president the new prime minister sorry uh, uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, mm. not just won a Nobel Prize for Peace but also he, he was a promising power uh, regionally and continentally because uh, he was young he he tried to promote a lot of reforms. But then, you know, a war broke out mm-hmm. in Ethiopia between Tigray region and the central government. And like everything is, uh, and again, a power of electricity and power of internet blockage and uh, and uh, things grow back, you know, instead of, uh, of going uh, for better future for the Ethiopian people. And that's happened in at many other um, places uh, in the continent. Uh, and uh, if you add to this the, the problem of the um, uh, weather crisis of the, um, how do you say it? Um, the, um, global warming, maybe? Yeah, global warming and the, the envir- environmental crisis. Like famines and stuff. Yeah, which affects mostly uh, areas in Africa. Yeah. Although there are not contributing a lot to this uh, phenomenon, but they are suffering from it. Yeah. The, the area for an, of Africa where Ethiopia is and also the area near the Sahara Desert, yeah. they are suffering the most, for example, famine mm-hmm. and uh, uh, the, the certification, uh, the progress of the desert to a rural area and all these things. And people are becoming more... Uh, in conflict because they are fighting over existence, you know, of uh, water and uh, yeah. food, and um, and this uh, instead, you know, of trying to look um, 
how how uh, people get uh, uh, go uh, to better future. Uh, there's no future. Th- yeah, That's to brighter, up- pu- more optimist uh, future. Uh, they are they are fighting each other for the day to day. Yeah, yeah, and they are buying weapons, for example, an enormous amount of money instead of food and food supplies and. We uh, build some uh, infrastructure, you know, to bring the food to the people. Yeah. Instead of this, they are in a, a political power uh, struggles, mm-hmm. and this is one of the problems they watch in many places uh, in Africa, and it's very um, sad because it should be uh, other way. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's very disheartening. I would say, you know, I I always think about uh, I I forget who said this. Once it was uh, some professor I was watching it, and he was saying how if you if they they did like some study where they realized that it's not where poor it's not necessarily poor places where there's a lot of crime it's where there's like a wealth discrepancy where one area has you know a lot of mm-hmm. wealth or you know they have resources and then another one does not that kind of like juxtaposition or that that creates the conflict where it's like you have these resources I don't. That creates violence. That creates creates chaos, and I always think about that in the Middle Eastern conflict as well. I'm like, how much of this is? Oh well, we want this. This is our land. This is our blah blah blah. Oh well, we're trying to do. I think sometimes it is an economic thing. I think it a lot of the times when people have food security, you know, upper, you know, being being able to elevate in their career, being being able to, uh, you know, you know, do their thing and have a, a good life. Um, a lot of the times they don't really care that much about the conflict or, oh, this person's doing better. Oh, this person owns this. You have that security. So insecurity, I think, is is the biggest leader to 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 crime, dependent on a lot of things. And I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a I dropped out of college. So you can you can answer this this question. <laughs> you know, I think, for example, uh, people uh, are fighting about uh, water. Because in Africa, like the Rhone of Africa and other places, there are a lot of nomad population. A lot of what? Nomads. Okay. Nomads. Uh, yeah. People, yeah. Uh, so uh, there is a lot of time uh, conflict between nomad population and uh, settled, uh, like agricultural communities. Yeah. Because they bring their uh, herds and they, you know, they're using the water and the, uh, the agriculture there. So... A, a lot of the conflicts is about that in many places. Uh, but the, the issue of, of, of shortage of water, like here in Israel, we are in the same area, like most of African states. We also uh, could suffer from a shortage of water, but because of the developer um, uh, industry and the agriculture and everything, you are, we are using well our water. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, uh, it's the issue that people, that the government, they don't give enough um, um, a, a attention, maybe, and the resources to issue of, of development. Yeah. For example, to develop uh, water sources, yeah. or to develop uh, some kind of agriculture that will be better suited for the changing uh, climate. Um, so this is the issue, but. Um, what I see common here between Israel, what happened now in Israel, and in many African states, is I, I maybe I will call it the politics of hate. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead of dealing with the issues such, such as the climate uh, crisis or the, the economical crisis, uh, pol- politicians sometimes tend to use the, the politics of hate mm-hmm. to hate another group. Mm-hmm. It's easier, you know, like it happened in Ethiopia to our the Tigrayan people, for example. Uh, the aid that was, uh, you know, uh, focus on them because of what they did in the past when they were in government or something like this. Instead of tracking the real problems of the uh, Ethiopian society and the way to, to handle it, uh, it's better to use the uh, means of violence and conflict and aid toward the others. And I'm afraid something like this is going now in Israel, you know, the yeah. split in the Israeli society and the way to use um, this politics of hate toward, uh, you know, people from the left wing, right wing, uh, religious people, uh, secular people, uh, all this kind of uh, rhetoric of hate. 
it's uh, something easier solution than to to deal with the real problem of society well I think social media has made things so much more polarized right like you know whether you're you you, you think you're on the right side <laughs> you, you think this guy's good I'm I, I'm good this guy's bad but the other person thinks that guy's bad I'm the one that's good so but the, the the real issue I think is like both of you guys can be right but that doesn't mean you should hate and also uh, most of the people are very mo- most people in the middle like the 80 percent on each side they're rational people you know they have their their certain preferences of life you know they want to live their life this way this other group want to, wants to live their lives with this way <clears throat> instead of focusing on the middle you know things are polarized on social media because of the outside you know maybe five ten percent the bad things that this side does on the extremes, the bad things that this side does on the extremes. And you see it all over, you know, but the thing is, that's the thing. I, I've been working on social media for a long time. Like those are the things that get clicks. Those are the things that people engage with the extremes, the violence, the hatred, you know, the, oh, look at this uh, Israeli doing this. Look at this Palestinian doing this. Look at this Tigrayan doing this. Look at this Amhara doing this. Look at this uh, Republican in America doing this. Look at this Democrat doing this. When in reality, it's like, trust me, all of those groups, there's a there's a rational side and then there's an irrational side. And instead of trying to focus on the middle, people people use it to get clicks. People use it to get bites. And the worst part is a lot of people make a lot of money from the conflict. That's the sad thing. I Probably the past year I've been realizing this. Um, especially after the uh, George Floyd stuff in America, I realized like, oh, like this is really like your channel, your Instagram, your TikTok. You are literally just pushing hate. You know, whether I'm for it or not, I'm like, hey, like, you know, let's kind of chill. Out. Let's try to figure out what the what the resolution is. So um, how much have you have you been seeing that kind of like in, in your expertise and your studies? Or is this something like I'm just like in my brain about? You know, one of my area of specialty is genocide studies. Genocide studies. Genocide uh, studies. Yeah. Oh wow. Because uh, you, 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 you. I was reading something. Your parents were actually part of the Holocaust. Yeah. Are your grandparents or your parents? My parents. Oh wow. Okay. My parents. I am a second generation. What's uh, it's wow. called? Yeah. My parents were children during the Holocaust. That's incredible. Yeah. And and one of the things that I feel most of my life is hate. Hate and unrational hate and uh, this is I think was my way to deal with it to learn about genocide about other cases than the holocaust you know for example genocide in Rwanda and other um, other uh, kind of genocide Darfur which I wrote a book on and uh, in uh, um, what we learn in genocide studies it's about the eighty percent that you are talking about people that don't really care. You know, there are the extremists in every side, and there is people we call them bystanders. Mm. They just uh, see what what will what will be going on. You know, maybe if I don't do anything, yeah, yeah, everything yeah, will be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, and this is the problem. You know, most of the people that staying uh, not True. involved. Yeah, this is amazing. What we. See here now in the protest in Israel, we never saw this amount of people, a uh, hundred of thousands of people that go every week to the street, you know, and uh, all their life, <laughs> put their life on hold yeah. and and just participating because they don't want to be bystanders. They want to to be active part in their future, you know. And uh, in time crisis, maybe people tend to be more uh, active. But uh, but I think this is one of the important thing is the way that you are choose to be activist, you know, because when you study about Africa, and I'm a historian, you know, and <laughs> people don't anticipate that I will be um, a activist. But I think you can't learn about the history of Africa and not be activist, mm-hmm. and not uh, you know I, I'm not uh, going to bring water, you know, but uh, but. But I, I think sometime about solution, like uh, the idea of African solution to African problem, that the the solution should come from inside the continent and not from outside intervention, but because it's never doing any good outside intervention. So I think that the solution. What makes should... you say that? Because I'm curious because that's that's a that sounds counterintuitive to most people. 
I mean, I, I kind of have an idea, but just for the audience or just for yeah. me to get a clear vision on it. Okay, because when I start to study about uh, the crisis in Darfur, Darfur is in the west of Sudan, and it was kind of unknown area. Even I, I didn't know a lot about it, so I start to read about Darfur, what happened there. And I saw that the African Union established some kind of force of peacekeeper to be there for the first time. And then I have the idea, so... Maybe it will be better if there will be African forces in the continent instead of, for example, the UN uh, missions there or, or in uh, uh, some kind of hybrid forces uh, that will act in the continent because an uh, African uh, organization should know better what is going, up there, uh, what is going on there. Yeah. And uh, uh, this is my uh, now field of research is to see what regional organization uh, are doing in order to mediate between uh, uh, rival parties in conflict. So uh, one of their achievements was the uh, agreement in Sudan that split Sudan and South Sudan to two different countries. So it was like the regional organization that called IGAD. It, w- it was a very important uh, mediator between the rival part of the South and the North of South Sudan. So this is one idea what could be done more from inside. And it's very complicated because, you know, because it's local um, government and local political forces and uh, rival parties, it's a very complicated issue. But I think that the solution sh- should come from within. This is my idea. So this is the idea that I'm trying to promote by my research. For example, the later, uh, latest conflict in uh, between Ethiopia and Tigray, what the regional organization done there or not should be done there. This is my idea. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I'm, I need to learn more about the Ethiopian uh, the Ethiopian conflict because I know something recently has been going on. Um, my family I, I, and what's funny is like, I always think I I, I I didn't even know until I'm not even I'm not kidding. I I did not even know what tribe I was a part of as far as like Amhara, Tigray, or whatever until maybe like two years ago. So this was like almost like a like a non-issue in my life until you know the polarization until the internal conflict happened and then it began so it, it it really showed me how kind of sometimes ridiculous it is especially if you're generation removed from from Ethiopia mm-hmm. you I don't talk to anybody and I'm like oh where what tribe are you from I'm like you hey you're Ethiopian if if we're in a bar right now and someone wants to fight me you got my back you're Ethiopian like me no no but you know so cuz I think the most important thing is is for, is for unity, but people don't see it that way. You know, people are very, very tribal, which is, you know, just a law of nature. But circling back, I want to get more information about, because you, you mentioned that one of your parents are your Holocaust writers, which is, which is crazy. But you also, you mentioned that you went to Ethiopia and uh, you saw someone have a Anne, Anne Frank book, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You want to tell that story? That's like a crazy story. And that kind of opened things up for you? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Um, we went to visit my daughter. She was a volunteer there. Uh, she taught Hebrew to uh, people that were waiting to make Aliyah to Israel. There is a camp there in Gondar. And uh, I was traveling in the street and I saw a bunch of um, children that living in the, uh, in the street. And they uh, were selling books on a um, on, uh, uh, blanket on the street, you know. And, what city was this? Gonda. Okay. Cool. It was in Gonda. And I asked him, I saw Anna Frank in Amharic. And it was a great surprise because I know a picture very well. Cool. But I never saw it in Amharic. So I asked the children. And you know, there are children, they, don't, they are not going to school. They are street. Uh, Making street, money. Yeah. Trying to make money. But they knew about her and told me something about her story. They know who she was. And it's amazed me because uh, I didn't know how universal is the character of Anna Frank. And uh, I'm writing in one of my articles that uh, Anna Frank um, stories resemble to my mother's story mm. because my mother also spent many years in a closed room, uh, like uh, most of her childhood, like from age eight to 12 in a room with older people. And uh, she was not allowed to go out from the room, you know. And um, uh, so there are many resemblance, but of course, the, my mother's story was uh, with better hair yeah. because she lives. But uh, but uh, 
But I think the resemblance between my mother and uh, Anne Frank was that they remain very optimistic and they believe in the good of people in spite of, despite of what happened around them. You know, my mother almost taught me to to look uh, at the best uh, at, at, at the best uh, at other people and never look, you know, uh, the difference between them. You know, not uh, race, not. Uh, a, a economic situation for for uh, people, men was a man and woman was a woman, and and this is something I think uh, that I, I I got it from uh, heritage as a, as a Holocaust survivor. You know, it's believing in the best. Yeah, <laughs> like I've I've realized even like in my own life, like some of the best people, some of the ones where really bad things can happen to them and they're they don't get emotional they don't uh you know blame it on this person blame it. they're the ones that usually have been through the the worst you know they've mm -hmm. been through a lot of a lot of a lot of they've seen a lot of evil and they've addressed it and they said i'm gonna choose this way you know but the other a lot of the times i mean obviously these are these are generalizations but sometimes when you have you know you've experienced a great life and never experienced bad things and then something bad happens, you become very emotional, you become, things become a bigger deal. So, you know, it, it's very, it sounds counterintuitive because you would think, oh, this person's experienced so much. So, you know, they would just, you know, retaliate very easily. But I have not seen that. The main thing I've seen is, man, I grew up, my dad was like this. He was just alcoholic. He was such a bad person. But I just always believed, I know that that was wrong. And I chose to try to do the best thing. I tried to say, no matter what, I'm going to do the right thing. And those people are usually the ones that they can borderline experience abuse and they're still like, I'm choosing the right way, yeah. which is a very, you know, a very admirable quality for, for anybody to, uh, to have. But your, your parents, what are like some, some stories that they, they told you about their experience there? Like that, that's crazy. Like I would love to have them here, but obviously, you know, I would love to know how, how, what they told you and like how that maybe shaped your life on top of just giving you a, a real life explanation or real life example in your home of like, don't judge people just by how they look like. So of course, both of the, my parents are horrible, you know, and the, the worst that you can think. Cause uh, my mother was eight years old when she saw her father taken away by the Nazis and she never saw, she was the only child very spoiled, you know, very highly educated people and rich people, you know, and, and she, she never saw him again and just, Later on, she was found that he was murdered. And the last thing that you remember is he, she is doing it like this, that they are going to kill him. This is the memory of an eight-year-old child. And my father was like um, 10 years old when his father was taken to Auschwitz. And so uh, they have terrible life with, uh, they starve, they, they, uh, but, but they remain, I think, um, uh, both very optimistic and very strong persons and it's very interesting because the people from the Holocaust that came here for Israel they are like the most successful people most of them they they are driven like mm -hmm. my my parents were the most intelligent people on on, on earth <laughs> but they didn't have any formal education because mm -hmm. uh, but but they were amazingly um uh, educated and knew everything you know but it's difficult, you know, but it's not just optimistic because to live with a, like a second generation to Holocaust survivor, in some way they remain children for all their life, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I have to become, I'm the oldest one, so I have to become you some kind of that trauma. trauma? You think because of the trauma? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Like they remain uh, some in some way very, very childish and uh, they stay in the, uh, like in the mental uh, age of like What's childhood. The trauma happen? Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I think uh, there is the uh, the uh, consequences to the second generation and even to the third generation. And I now I have grandchildren even to the fourth generation. You no, know? how so? Would you say specifically? Uh, because uh, many things that I carry with me mm -hmm. and I, I that you got from yes, for my childhood and then like fears and uh, um, uh, sometimes to be very stiff, you know, and. Uh, Paranoia, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, also like, because the 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 beauty of Israelis specifically, I've noticed is like, they're extremely resourceful and they're very like 
oh, you want to do this? Okay, cool. Let's do it. <laughs> like I hit you up to do this and you're just like, yeah, let's do it. You know, it's very like humility to the point of like, you're like, why not? You know, you never know what could happen. So let me just, you know, whatever opportunity I have, let me just share it because you, you know, I think it's obviously, you know, you don't want to be too paranoid, but in life, if you don't grow up, like for me, you know, we don't have a ton of money. A lot of the times people that grow up, they don't have a ton of money. They're way more, you know, okay, I need some, I need to get my security from, you know, my environment. I need to, you know, so it is a good thing. Obviously, you know, you don't want too much, you know, neuroti neuroticism and like paranoia, but um, I think it's a good thing, you know, like, hey, this is what happened. I need to make sure that, you know, everything's taken care of, everything is good and things are solid. But um, speaking on that, and, you know, this isn't your area of expertise, obviously, but something that I, I think a lot of people in America, my, my audience is primarily American audience. Um, what 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 I guess is going on in, in the political area, um, there was a new bill passed that essentially uh, removed a lot of the, the power that the Supreme Court had and moved it to the, the Knesset, which the Knesset, in America, we have the executive branch, the uh, legislative branch, mm -hmm. and the uh, Supreme Court, the, mm -hmm. the judicial branch. But the Knesset is kind of the legislature and the executive combined, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. I, I think. No, also the government. So. Yeah, the, the, mm -hmm. the government, yeah. So it's essentially what what uh, Netanyahu's party did, and you can come in and interrupt at any time if you feel like I'm saying something that isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, it, it essentially, t instead of reforming the, the Supreme Court, which he had uh, mentioned that he was going to or kind of ran on that on that uh, assumption, and a lot of people thought that there was going to be a, a reform because there isn't like a solidified constitution in, in Israel. It's more of like a, it's a different system. Um, instead of doing that, he essentially created a, a situation where the Supreme Court had way less power, almost re removing any sort of veto powers that they have and moving those rights over to the Knesset. Um, there was big protests happening. There was a lot of uh, up uprising, people saying, hey, like separation of powers, extremely important. It's how you hold people accountable, how you, you know, make sure that there's a di di diversification of thought, diversification of, of what's best for the country. Uh, what What is your like perspective on that and kind of like if you can expand on kind of how I structured that. Yeah, I think you explained it very well, but uh, it's it's the threat on democracy, mm. democracy actually. And, uh... Well, his rationale, I've, I've seen an interview of his, the rash, and I'm being devil's advocate because I think this is like a horrible argument that he's making, is, uh, well, the Knesset is actually the one that's voted in so it's actually more democracy that, yeah. you know, the people that are voted in are the people which is any American that hears that is like and understands how governments are structured. It's like, bro, what? But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah um, I think that it doesn't matter what are the, the excuses. I think what is happening is it's thinking uh, like wonderful enterprise like the state of Israel with, with its many defaults. Like uh, the occupation for me, it's default and uh, it should be corrected, you know, occupation of the territories, of the Palestinian territories. But, but still, it's, it's kind of a success story. And I'm looking at it from perspective of many African countries that went to become independent at the same time as Israel became independent from the British. And uh, they are not success stories. So you see, like, uh, it's okay... You understand why uh, there is political instability there and why the uh, democracy doesn't work there. But here, everything was uh, uh, fine, you know. And and the danger is, is that it, in, the danger is that uh, it's going to be destroyed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I think one of the things that we talk about is the politics of hate. Of uh, and I think. Uh, they are ma manipulating the aid between uh, various groups. I, I should uh, maybe mention one thing, that uh, d during one of the protests that uh, I participated, an old man come towards me and say, uh, you are stinky Ashkenazi, I, I'm very sorry that Hitler didn't uh, finish all of you. Some kind of old man. Uh, Israeli? Israeli, yeah. yeah. This is yeah. Israeli this, this, to Israeli yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. 
And one of the eights that they are promoting now, it's between people Ashkenazi and not Ashkenazi, people that came from, uh, from the Middle East or from... Uh, Sephardic, yeah. Sephardic, yeah. They came from the Middle East or Northern Africa. And many people from this country say, this is not my uh, opinion about it. Why, why are you are talking? Like many um, uh, government ministers are promoting this kind of uh, good. And many people say that I am uh, came from me and Perth came from Morocco, and it's 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 not my perspective about it. But but some people do hear it, you know, and they are using it and they are casting each other and say uh, you should be exterminated by the Nazis, you know. Even this kind of hate, yeah, it's it's very deep, and you know, it's very um, this is audience that it's very easy to manipulate, you know. You know from uh, recent this. <laughs> What happened in the States recently, you know, uh, in the last election, I think. Uh, so it's very uh, easy to manipulate some kind of population. And that's what happened here. And this is one of the things that frightened me the most, is this uh, uh, the na- dynamic of hate and the way you manipulate uh, groups against each, o- against each other. And this is the, the dangerous thing that's uh, mm-hmm. going to be uh, alongside with the, like what called the, um, the reform, the um, uh, low uh, legal reform, but uh, mm-hmm. the issue is more the, the split within the society and the aid, the, the internal aid between, because I'm dealing with conflict studies, so I know how easy it's to manipulate one group toward the other. Especially with this thing, the, with the phone. With the phone and even, uh, you know, like... Uh, TikTok specifically, I know that, you know, TikTok, which is owned by ByteDance, which, you know, any any Chinese company is going to be essentially controlled or some sort of influence by the Chinese government. I think they're aligned with Iran. So my thinking is, you know, that that TikTok being in, in any country, that's a, definitely a weapon that, that can be used to change people's minds about certain things and have people perceive things a certain way. I think social media... The tough thing about a, a thing like TikTok is it's tough to track whether there's any sort of biases being, you know, used or exploited by, you know, whoever owns it or whoever controls the people that own it. Um, I mean, media has been used to manipulate the masses since the dawn of time. I'm sure, I'm sure you know this. I mean, even in unfortunately the Hitler Hitler times. So this is nothing new. It's just a little bit more complex than just a newspaper or like a, you know, NBC or CBS or something like that. So I think it's a, I think it's something that is something that for sure needs to be looked out for. Like, hey, let's make sure that these social media apps specifically are not being used to uprise a particular group to create conflict to destroy. Because a lot of people want to destroy Israel. I mean, that's nothing, no secret. So any sort of entryway, I think, uh, is unfortunately maybe being used. I mean, maybe I'm just pessimistic. I know I don't know. So we were gonna talk about the uh, the. Uh, is it, how do you say it? Fight love it? Uh, fight love it. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Okay, so um, Jack uh, Oyakov Fight love it was, um, by Ibu name is Yakov, but uh, his name was uh, uh, Jack Fight love it. He was um, um, a Jewish, a uh, Jew from um, Poland uh, who uh, learned uh, linguistic at the Sorbonne University in France, in Paris. And uh, he, he has a lot of interest. He had a lot of interest uh, on Semitic languages. And then I would he come to uh, encounter Amharic language, and uh, he arrived to Ethiopia. And uh, you know, they say that he was the founder. He find the the Ethiopian Jews community. <laughs> but I don't like this idea, you know, because they say that uh, all the explorers find Africa. <laughs> It was there before, you know, but but uh, but many people didn't know uh, about the Jewish people uh, in Ethiopia at the time. It, it was a good for the West. Or... Yeah. Okay. Someone was before him, one of his teachers, it's called Yosef Alevi, and he was like the second one that arrived to Ethiopia. And he traveled uh, f- many, many times. And uh, he was, uh, uh, he wrote a lot about uh, the, the culture and the heritage and the religion. And uh, the language, he was a linguistic, so uh, yeah, he has a lot of he had a lot of interest in the linguistic, uh, and uh, he uh, collected a lot of um, uh, handwriting and uh, 
uh, and uh, later on he lived in Tel Aviv and uh, he had a large collection, which is uh, after his death, he, I don't know if he or someone else uh, handed it to, to, to our university, to Tel Aviv University Library. And we have it here. It's one of the most important um, uh, literature co- uh, collection uh, about Ethiopian Jews. And um, um, some of uh, some of it, it's even uh, waiting for uh, you know a, a lot of people to come and explore it because uh, we have a lot of uh, interest here in, in Israel uh, in many aspects of uh, Ethiopian Jews' life in uh, the um, uh, religion and uh, archaeology. We have even one archaeologist here in the university which is doing uh, archaeological. Um, Uh, sites of Ethiopian Jews in Ethiopia. We have a lot of interest, but still m- m- a lot uh, is still unknown about Ethiopian history, Ethiopian yeah. Jewish history. And uh, I think it's very important uh, collection that uh, is here in the university. Yeah, because I think, uh, I mean, there's always been, I mean, that was a big, I mean, Egypt, Ethiopia, like, you know, the Middle East, like that's a big like center hub for trade for however long period of, period of time, you know, the Arabian Peninsula, that's where everybody met. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, it, even in the Bible, Ethiopians were or in the, the Old Testament Bible, um, the, the uh, Ethiopians were mentioned there too. So um, I think there's a lot, there's a lot there, I, which is super interesting for me. I'm learning every day, you know, through conversations with, exactly. with you from online. So I think it's people, I think it's something that people are super interested in, especially in, in America. There's a lot of confusion about Jews, Israelites, Israel, you know, what it means, who they are, you know, it, it's always in the news. People hear about it. People know about the Jewish people. People know about Israelis, but they usually don't have a ton of friends or people that they know that are um that are Israeli or Jewish so it's very important i think for for us to to have conversations and discuss and put a face and a human to what they may be talking about or what they might hear on the news because you know that that's the biggest thing i think to fight to fight hate is understanding conversations being frank being open so I appreciate you hopping on. I know you did not need to do this, but you know you're 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 a team player, which I'm sure has gotten you far. Which you just say, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. <laughs> appreciate it.